I'm not singing. Um, I just thought I'd throw that out there. Um, I'm going to be reading to you from Mark, um, chapter 13. I'm going to have to hold this up. It's too little. Um, As he was leaving the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what massive stones, what magnificent buildings. Do you see all these great buildings, replied Jesus? Not one stone here will be left on another. Every one will be thrown down. As Jesus was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign that they are all about to be fulfilled? Jesus said to them, Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name, claiming, I am he, and will deceive many. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. These are the beginning of birth pains. You must be on guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and flogged in the synagogues. On account of me, you will stand before governors and kings as witnesses to them. And the gospel must first be preached to all nations. Whenever you are arrested and brought to trial, do not worry beforehand about what to say. Just say whatever is given you at the time, for it is not you speaking, but the Holy Spirit. Brother will betray brother to death and a father his child. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of his house go down or enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. How dreadful it will be in those days for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that this will not take place in winter, because those will be days of distress unequaled from the beginning, when God created the world until now, and never to be equaled again. If the Lord had not cut short those days, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, whom he has chosen, he has shortened them. At that time, if anyone says to you, Look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will appear and perform signs and miracles to deceive the elect, if that were possible. So be on your guard. I have told you everything ahead of time. But in those days, following that distress, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time, men will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. And he will send his angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heavens. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that it is near right at the door. I tell you the truth. This generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. No one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard, be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with his assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight or when the rooster crows or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. Thank you, Andrew. Well, this year as we uh, move toward Christmas, we're doing it kind of an old-fashioned way. I'm I'm sure that you've heard of Advent. Most of us have. Uh, That means technically winter Lent is what Advent means. And it was a a season that the church used to practice um, as a time of repentance leading up to Christmas. And Christmas began on uh, Christmas Day, not two months ahead of time. 
And then back in those old days, which we're not doing this, but you can think about it. You had 12 days of Christmas, which ran from Christmas until Epiphany. And Epiphany was the actually the first celebration the church ever had, even before Easter and Christmas. And Epiphany was the presentation of the King of Kings of Jesus to the Gentile world. And so that's the way it used to be. And now we're not going to be legalistic about this, but I just felt it'd be good for us to kind of revisit some of the practice of Advent, uh, the time of preparation. Um, Quite honestly, we get a little weary of the, quote, celebration that takes place. Most of us do. Um, You can only sing so many Christmas carols uh, for now six, seven weeks. I mean, right after... um, Right after Halloween is when we start the Christmas celebration now. So I thought it'd be good to do that. And um, the first part of this is always the, has been the text has been used in the church has been the return of Jesus Christ, like we just heard from Mark 13. Now this, this passage is similar to some other passages in the Gospels where Jesus told what will happen in the future. And it, it really does have a lot to do with Christmas because they they tell of the continuing work that needs to be done uh, by the king who, who came as a baby. And they also relate the need for, for preparation for us because Jesus says that, you know, like it or not, things are going to get worse before they get better, before things are completely put back to order. It's going to look worse. And really it sounds, the whole thing sounds a little unbelievable to us. Now, this is not a text that we often used in church because, quite honestly, it's been used and misused so many different places that we, we kind of have an aversion to that and think that if we talk about this too, too much, people are going to think that I'm kind of a religious nut. Am I, I mean, am I speaking the truth here? So when you watch movies, you know, uh, what I thought about is we watch movies about the skyline of New York. Uh, one thing that you always see now is you look at the skyline and you can tell whether the movie was made before you know, 2001 or not, because if the Twin Towers are there, then you know that, well, this is prior to 2001, but if you don't see the Twin Towers, you think, well, this is after 9-11. And I want us just to begin with this morning to imagine that that you're there on that dedication day in 1973 of the Twin Towers, and you're, you're out in the street in Manhattan, and you're looking up at this massive structure of aluminum and steel and concrete, and it's like, wow the tallest buildings in the world at that time. And you think, if we can do this, we can do anything. Look at these things. They're just unbelievable. And then this guy comes up to you and he, you know, he says, well, you know, he says, hey, buddy, um, uh, this, this generation, um, by the time that this generation is gone, this, this is all going to be flat. It's just going to be a pile of rubble here. Uh, none of this is going to be standing up these Twin Towers. And it's just going to be a twisted mess of steel and rubble. And, and you probably feel like, hey, please, man, just go some, tell somebody else because I'm not one of those guys. I don't get into that conspiracy stuff. And, you know, and, and yet he would have been right, wouldn't he? Taken 28 years for that to be right. But had he prophesied and said, this is all going to fall down, he would have been right. And it uh, just no one would have believed him then. And that day that the disciples are with Jesus, they're there in Jerusalem. And this temple is an impressive structure. Now, these four guys that it mentions, they're, you know, they're the, the fishermen, Peter, Andrew, James, and John. And they've come down from Galilee, and Galilee is kind of the rural area, if you know what I mean. You get to Jerusalem, and you could, uh, for miles and miles away, you could see the glistening limestone of the temple and the gold on the outside. And what a privilege it is for pilgrims to make that, that journey to Jerusalem because, you know, this is it. This is where God meets human beings, is there inside this temple, you know, and the, you know, they would say, man, isn't this something? Look at this, Jesus. And he says, hey, it's all coming down soon. It's all coming down. And, and, this, and this teaching by Jesus has the, the potential, I think, to be one of the most essential things. I don't, I'm not sure we grasp this. This is an essential teaching of Jesus. If we get past all of the predictions of when this is all going to happen, and you look at what he's saying to us, this is an essential teaching of Jesus Christ. This text is understandable. And when we understand it, we're challenged to look at the core of how we're living. 
Now Jesus says, it's all coming down. And the disciples say, when? And Jesus speaks at length about the destruction of the temple and the end of the world system and his return. But in verse 32, notice that he said, no one knows about that day or hour, not even the angels in heaven, nor the son, but only the father. In other words, I don't know when. And then verse 35, he says, therefore keep watch because you don't know when. The disciples ask, when? And Jesus says, I don't know. I don't know when, and neither do you. And I mean, that seems really clear. Isn't, isn't this clear here? And yet Christians have spent all their time trying to figure out when. When is this going to happen? Probably heard, um, you know, about Harold Camping. Remember Harold Camping? A president of Family Radio, and there a few years ago, he got a lot of attention because he said Jesus would return on May the 21st, and then the world would end on October the 21st. I don't know what was going on between May and October, but, but anyway, as soon as you hear, hear a prediction like that, make plans for October 22nd, because you know the guy is not speaking the truth. Because if the only begotten son didn't know when this was going to happen, you think that, that God the Father is going to tell some TV evangelist, radio evangelist, when it's going to be, and, and he alone? So this passage is not about when. And Jesus says, I don't know, and you don't know. So, so, so what's this about? Well, you know, if you were doing the inductive method of Bible study, which is, which is a good way to do things, I think, uh, you might circle these words. Uh, some words stand out to me. Jesus says, watch out, keep watch, keep watch, watch, be on your guard, be on your guard, be on guard, be alert. Eight different sayings here that mean kind of the same thing. I mean, is there any question what this passage is really about? It's not about when. It's being on your guard. The only question is, what are we supposed to watch out for, right? What are we on guard about? And, and it is Jesus would say, uh, what it is that Jesus would say is dangerous to you and me as followers is so that we have to be alert and watchful. And the first thing I, th I think he says in verse 5, Jesus says, watch out that no one deceives you. Watch out that no one's deceived. Now, I don't know about you, but being deceived is one of the scariest things I think there is. Because when you're deceived, you don't know you're deceived. Right? You wouldn't be deceived. And he says, watch out that nobody deceives you. So how do you know if you're deceived? You don't know if you're deceived. <laughs> That's the whole point. So you think, okay, I'm good with God, man. Everything's cool. Everything's great. I'm totally following God. I'm with God. And you're not because you're deceived. Harold Camping thinks that he's following God, see? But he's deceived. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 6, he says, Many will come in my name claiming I'm he and will deceive many. So there's going to be a lot of deceivers, a lot of people deceived, Many people getting deceived. So, so you may have this experience where you're like, wow, everybody's doing that. And that, you know, there's a lot of people that are doing that, going there. And yet there's something that just doesn't seem right. You know, I think about everything that Jesus said and God did. The whole, you know, text of Scripture. Something's just kind of out of whack here. Why am I not comfortable with this? Now, how is it that many people are, could be deceived? Well, both times here, when Jesus talks about being deceived, it's in the context, context of some severe distress that's in the world. Uh, wars, earthquakes, famines. What happens when there's a war, earthquake, famine, global disaster of some kind? Uh, people get freaked out. People become afraid. Uh, they get traumatized. And they're looking for some kind of fix, some kind of easy fix in an easy way. You know, they're looking for anything. We, we just had the whole Ebola thing. I guess that's gone now, right? Because it's not in the news anymore. But there for about a month, you know, Americans were ready to take anybody that was from Africa and put them in a special place for a while. You know, we're going to lock them up. Just like we locked up the Japanese in World War II, Right? And we look back on that now, we go, oh, that was so wrong. But there are a lot of people that were ready to, let's just take them all, put them in some kind of a compound, you know. Why? Because we're afraid. 
And ignorance and fear together is so toxic. I mean, human beings, especially in mass, do some really crazy things. They're deceived. And one of the marks of false Christianity is that it will promise immediate relief. Remember this, immediately relief. This will fix things. That's one of the promise always of false Christ- Christianity or false religion. I mean, uh, one example I think about in our culture right now is uh, the prosperity gospel that's been around for 30, 40 years, you know, which is saying you don't need to ever suffer, you don't need to ever do without. If you are um, gods, then you will, you will have plenty of money, you will never get sick, nothing bad, you know, what happened to Paul, that all happened to Paul, but you're, that's not going to happen to you because you've got more faith, you know, you know how to do this. That's what's the, the, the prosperity gospel, and it's just like this easy, immediate fix you know, and when we see that, something that's just going to fix life for us real simply, we need to have some alarms, you know. We're easily deceived. But in our culture, we get set up because, I mean, we think, why, why should following Jesus have to be this hard? This ought to be easy, you know. There's an aversion to adversity that we naturally have. We want the easy path. The easy path is not always the right path. And oftentimes when we're looking for the easy path, it's easy to be deceived. So many times we're deceived because we think that we, we might have to wait or it might be hard or that it's not from God. And just the opposite is true. So Jesus says, don't get pulled into that stuff. You know, my return is going to be so obvious. He says, verse 26, everyone's going to see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. You can't miss it unless... You're looking for an immediate relief right now. So, so watch out for getting deceived. And the second thing he warns us about in verse 9, he says, you have to be on your guard. You're going to be handed over to local councils, be flogged in the synagogues. Well, we don't go to synagogue, right? So we're not real worried about that. Verse 12 says, brother will betray brother to death, father his child. That gets our attention. This this one is just frightening, isn't it? The thought of being persecuted. Children will rebel against their parents and have them put to death. All men will hate you because of me, but he who stands firm to the end will be saved. So, you know, general teaching here is to watch out for caving under persecution. And, and don't we wish that Jesus would have said, listen, follow me and everything's going to be wonderful. Life's just never, you're never going to have any problems again. You'll never have any problems. They'll just write you checks and everything's going to be great. But the, the burden of, of enduring disapproval, not even persecution, but just disapproval by the culture, is a baton that's passed from generation to generation. And, you know, it's getting worse, I think. Um, I'm one of the older ones in the room, and I have a perspective that's a little bit longer than yours, and so that doesn't mean that I'm always right. But my perspective is is that in the 30 years that I've been a Christian, it is getting much worse. The tide is turning here. And we are not under persecution, but, but Christianity is the most persecuted religion in the world right now. I mean, live in Syria and be a Christian, live in Iraq and be a Christian, see what it's like just to, to name a few countries, not to, you know, North Korea, uh, China, the way it used to be. And from my perspective is that this is increasing. And, our, you know, our, our battle, though, and what we usually go to is we want to fight the culture. We want to make the culture Christian so we're not persecuted. That's not the battle. The battle's in here. This is where the battle is, is who am I serving? Will I stand with Christ? Will I cave under pressure? And historically, the death from persecution has has not been sudden. Historically, it's kind of a death by a thousand cuts. It's day by day by day, you know, just giving in just a little bit. Now, let me explain something here that that might make this passage a little easier for you. Jesus' prophetic utterance here. Uh, is, and I believe, an example of a type of prophecy that some people would call um, common in the Bible. It it's, would be like a, a 
bifocals prophecy. I wear bifocals, you know, because I can't see a distance and I can't see near either one. So, you know, they're both it's just a mess. And the first time you get bifocals, you're walking around trying to go down steps and just feeling really old. But, but you know, there's two different lenses here in my glasses. Um, I have the kind that you can't see, so you don't know that I'm old. Um, but... But anyway, I've got bifocals on, right? Those of you who got bifocals understand. But the prophet sees something from God and speaks it forward, but it has two dimensions to it. Okay, there's a close dimension and there's a far-sighted dimension. And the prophet does not distinguish. This is not chronological. But the, the, the end times, the last days, began on the cross. Okay, and they've been going all this 2,000 years, and Jesus doesn't distinguish between things that were to happen in the generation right there with the synagogue and the temple when the temple would be torn down and things that would happen at his return. They're mixed together in this. And so, you know, uh, it's, it's kind of difficult to distinguish that, but if you know that as you're, as you're reading the scripture, then you, you, you'll try... To, to stop sorting it all out. All the warnings are pertinent for the entire time. And as we see it here in verse 2 of this passage, Jesus says, not one stone will be left on another. Everyone will be thrown down. He says in verse 30, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. And that's the near-term part of the prophecy. That's the close-up part. And that's the bottom half of the bifocals prophecy. And a generation in Hebrew term was, was about 40 years. It's about the same way in ours, and yet 37 years after Jesus spoke this this prophecy, the Romans did tear the temple down. And there was a great persecution in Jerusalem. And thousands, thousands of Jews were crucified, you know, during this. And that's the near term. It happened. Okay, short term. But there's also this far term prophecy that's included in this, which the entire world order will be shaken. It will be brought down. And then the Lord returns in his power, okay, and in his glory, and he brings with him the fullness of the kingdom, and he redeems this earth. And that's what we're looking forward to right now. So what did the people put their security in in the first part of this prophecy? What is he warning us not to put our security in in the second part of the prophecy? The first generation he, he, he tells them in verse 14, he says, When you see the abomination that causes desolation standing where it does not belong, and that phrase is from the book of Daniel. It's used three times. It refers to something that happens in the temple, sacrilegious. In, in AD 70, Roman soldiers brought their military emblems with Caesar on it, declaring him God, into the temple. It was sacrilegious. They actually sacrificed a pig on the altar. You know, they desecrated that temple. And what does Jesus say to do? Jesus says, let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let no one on the roof of this house go down to enter the house to take anything out. Let no one in the field go back to get his cloak. And this is, this is counterintuitive for the, for the wisdom of Jesus because where is the safest place if you were a Jew and you were in Jerusalem? You would run to the temple. That's where you would go. That was, that was the stronghold, and that was where God met you. So you would go there, and Jesus says, don't go there. Okay, well, a lot of the Jews ran there. The Christians fled to the mountains. Very few of them went through this persecution. Jesus' warning worked. They listened to it, see. So that's where you're going to run. Jesus says, don't put your security even in that, because... All of that's coming down. The security that we see in the world today where we normally go. He says, don't go there. All that's going to be destroyed. So you should flee and go the other way. Now, what is it that you and I would be likely to put our security in today as the end of the world system approaches and the return of Christ comes near? Well, some people put their, their faith in the global economic system. I mean... I think we know after 2008 that that's not that secure. Would you really like to trust the euro or Fannie Mae with your future? I don't think so. Are we really thinking the eurozone's going to hold together forever? No. Some of us might think, well, our government won't let that happen to us. Really? Is Do, do you know a 
politician that you completely trust in? Do, do, do you think that your government will protect the Christian above protecting itself? So where do you go? You go, oh man, you're right. I, I can't put my security in that. I know that I'm, what I'm going to put my security in, I'm going to put my security in my family and my kids. I, I'm going to hunker down with my friends and my family in some remote place, you know, because I can trust my family. Really? Well, Jesus says your, your family, you can't even trust them. They'll, they'll turn against their parents. They'll betray them to death. Not everybody can put their, their trust in family. So what is it that we can put our trust in at this time? Jesus tells us in verse 31, he says, Earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. We just, we just go right over that. Jesus' words, his truth, the one thing that when you shake everything, this will not move. It will stand forever. It will never be overturned. His kingdom, if you're living in it now, will last forever. Jesus is saying that in distress, that, that it's to come. Don't put your trust in the wrong place uh, because it's going to let you down. The only thing that you can lock into fully is to lean on the words of Jesus Christ. Him and Him alone. That's what's going to hold you up. So we must tighten our attachment on Jesus. Right now in America, it's totally possible to follow Jesus and to have comfort. It's possible to follow Jesus Christ and have social acceptance. That's possible now. Jesus is saying that is not always going to be possible. Those two words of following him and comfort are going to split. Jesus is going to go this way and comfort is going to go the other way. And at that moment, you're going to have to hear a great tearing sound as every place where your desire to be comfortable to take the road least or the road most traveled is torn out of your life on everything that you are. And am I going this way because I want acceptance, because I want comfort, because it's the easy way? Or am I willing to give that up knowing that only the road of Christ is the true road? And hang on to the one thing that will not move, which is his word. What we can do, what can we do now to, to watch out, to be aware, to, to, you know, to take those, those eight commandments that he gave us. We can begin to internally loosen our attachment. Uh, if I've got to have relief and if I've got to have acceptance, if I've got to have security, and we begin to attach our our. Uh, to, to strengthen our attachment to Jesus Christ and to his word so that when the split comes that we're on the right side of it and we're standing with him. I want you to imagine a family who's living in a modest home and it's a good home and it, it meets their needs but it's also far from perfect and you know the pipes are getting old and the floors are all scratched up and the walls have marks on them and the kitchen is way outdated and one day grandpa visits and he says, you know, he says, I'm going to save my money and in 10 years, I'm going to give you a brand new home. It'll take me 10 years to save my money, but I'm going to re redo everything. New floors, new appliances, wiring, roof, siding, everything was going to be redone. And that night the family were celebrating because they believed Grandpa what he said. It's going to take 10 years, but after he left, they, they faced a decision. How do you live in this, uh, in this new house? How do you live in this old house that's getting ready to become a new house? With some sarcasm, the, the oldest son says, who cares how we live? It's going to be redone. I say we trash the place and we just live it up. And the daughter says, well, we can just live here, but let's spend all of our time and energy dreaming about the house to come, of making plans and picking out everything perfect to go in it. And the father says, well, I'm not fixing another thing here. I'm done fixing this old house. This thing's worn me out. I'm not patching holes. If it breaks, it stays broken. I'm not sanding the floors. I'm not fixing doors. As long as the roof doesn't collapse, we're just going to wait this thing out. And the family's mom uh, listened and then said, well, here's the thing. It, it will be wonderful to get a brand new home, but now even before it comes, we have to live in this home like we're going to live in the brand new one. If we trash this house, we'll just learn 
how to trash houses. And we should dream and we should plan for the new house, but if we only think about the new home, we're gonna miss the goodness that's still here. And if we never fix anything, we'll need to live with more things broken than are necessary. So seeing the broken things will just make us sad. So she said, so from now on, you need to imagine like we're going to live in the new house now, live in this house just like we will be in the new one. We're living with the promise, aren't we? We're in between. We're in between the coming of the king and the fullness of his kingdom. And he says, watch, be alert, be on guard. How we live today in the kingdom, which is here in part, will determine if we're ready and willing to receive the king when he returns in his glory to make a new heaven and a new earth. Now, see, that's a challenge, isn't it? It's a real challenge. Let's sit for a moment prayer in that. Dip your heart in the streams of life Let the pain and the sorrow Be washed away In the waves of His mercy As deep cries out 